Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today I'm in South Baltimore in Federal Hill and behind me is a bar called The Outpost. Take a look at it, it is on the corner. It fits seamlessly into the block of row houses that it's part of. It has a wonderful door right on the corner. It even has what I think was a side door. It is a classic Baltimore bar. That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm thrilled that Rachel Donaldson from the BMI, Baltimore Museum of Industry, is gonna join me. They just put up a new exhibit on corner bars. If you wanna know more, definitely go take a look at that and join us. Dr. Donaldson's gonna lead a walking tour uh, of corner bars in South Baltimore. Uh, we'll put the date uh, and time for that uh, at the end of this video. But let's jump in and talk about bars. There have been bars, of course, forever. The ancient Greeks had them. The ancient Romans built them along their famous roads. If the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome, you could pretty much bar hop your way there. Uh, we got our first bar, I think, in America in 1634 in Boston when the Puritans were running that city. I don't know when Maryland got its first bar, but in 1750, we got the Middleton Tavern that's still there in Annapolis. And of course, in Baltimore in the 1770s, the horse you came in on, Saloon in Fells Point, uh, we did a video on that. But those were really colonial taverns. Yes, locals went there, but really they were for people on the go. You could get a drink, you could get a meal, probably spend the night there. The corner bars uh, really were fundamentally different. They were catering to a hyper-local audience. In the heyday, as few as 50 or 60 folks would be good enough to support uh, a local bar. Um, and we had loads of them. To give some example, in 1899, Baltimore had a population of about 500,000, and we had 1,889 saloons. Uh, today, we have a population of 600,000, and we have 600 fewer liquor licenses, a substitute for a count on corner bars. The proliferation was largely because of breweries. They were in competition with each other, and they would sponsor or underwrite bars. So a, a corner bar might have a lot of different types of whiskey, but would serve only one type of beer. The breweries also underwrote food. You could go at lunchtime and often get a free lunch. Bread, pickles, salami or bologna, maybe a hard-boiled egg, pretty good. Um, and the bars that we had were called stand-ups. They didn't have bar stools. You would go as a man, we'll talk about women in a second, but the men would stand up and have their drink or uh, uh, eat their food, talk politics or union organizing or whatever. Um, if you were a woman, you pretty much did not go to bars, mostly because you couldn't. Uh, bars were really for men. You could go and get beer to go, maybe to drink on your stoop or your backyard with your friends. And you often could go and get food at lunchtime, but you'd have to go in that corner or that side door and sit at a table only for women. Um, bars in Baltimore back then were also segregated by race. If you were a white Baltimorean, you might go to Billy Kepler's bar on North Street in downtown town known for its great pictures of ball players and race horses or you might go to Ruth's bar on Conway Street near the B&O warehouse uh, the Ruth of course is Babe Ruth's father the bar is no longer it's now where the ball field maybe fittingly where the ball field is in Camden Yards if you were a black Baltimorean, you might go to a place called Judge Cole's on Pennsylvania Avenue near Landvale Street. If you went there, you were drinking only Maryland rye whiskey, and it was on the honor system. A small glass that you poured your own, it was five cents, a tall glass, 10 cents, and then you paid uh, on your way out. The black bars in Baltimore also were different than the white bars in that they often had live music, maybe a precursor to the lounge, and often women joined men right up at the bar uh, drinking and eating. Um, prohibition in the 1920s pretty much wiped out saloons, sort of the first iteration of our corner bars. You could have, you could drink alcohol there, but they didn't serve that same social function that corner bars did. But after prohibition, at least in Baltimore, saloons might have, that word might have gone away, but corner bars pretty much seamlessly popped back up. And all through the Great Depression, through the migration of workers for World War II, through the social and political upheaval of the 1960s and 70s, through the jobs upheaval from manufacturing to white collar and healthcare, uh, the corner bar here in Baltimore has soldiered on. And I'm gonna wrap up by saying that, yes, things have changed. Most corner bars now 
know, have bar stools. Uh, men and women uh, frequent the bars, and uh, most no longer have free food, at least that I know of. But the basic function of serving as a hyper-local gathering place to socialize and gossip and talk uh, for neighbors has not changed. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Rachel Donaldson from the BMI. Thanks, Johns. Hi, I'm Rachel Donaldson. I'm the curator at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and I'm here to talk to you about saloons. Um, as John said in his segment, um, saloons were the, the term that were, bars were called from the 1870s to 1920, again, of course, ending with prohibition. So this was known as the saloon period. And during this time, bars were also referred to as working man's clubs. In the late 19th century, clubs and fraternal societies were all the rage, particularly among men, middle to upper middle class, even wealthy men. Well, for working men, saloons became their clubs. They were places where you didn't have to pay dues and you didn't have to go through really elaborate in initiation rites, but you came and you would see the same people and you formed a network there. Um, and what we're really emphasizing in this exhibit is the community aspect of saloons. The fact that they were places where you would go see the same people, um, everyone would know your name. Um, they also were places that men could have their mail held if they didn't have a mailbox. They were provided some of the only public bathrooms. Um, they were places where you could get free food with the price of a drink. And the other thing was they were really homey. So there were places where people wanted to stay, especially if you were a working class man, a single man who had really terrible living conditions. So America is a nation of drinkers. And this goes back to our beginnings. But in the early Republic period, people mostly drank spirits. And that began to change with the first wave of German immigrants in the 1830s and 1840s, and where they brought beer and brewing beer. So most of our major uh, brewers that we had in this country in the mid-19th century were German. And of course, this is no different in Baltimore. Um, so uh, there was a very strong German connection to both the uh, uh, rise of corner saloons sponsored by German breweries, and also in the nature of labor organizing. One of the other things that we're really emphasizing in this exhibit is even though saloons were sites of leisure, they're also sites of work for the bartenders that operated them for anywhere to 14 to 15 hours a day when they are, of course, pouring drinks, keeping an eye on unruly customers and managing all aspects of, of saloon life. So like other workers of the era, they organized into unions. In Baltimore, one of the first ones was the Saloon Keepers Union in 1886 that turned into the Saloon Keepers Progressive Union. And the German connection there was that the union was very much tied to the German trades union. Um, the other thing about this union was that it was pretty radical for the time, which of course is, is, is not really unusual. It was strongly anti-capitalist. So this German saloon keepers union uh, pushed for things that um, other workers wanted at the time, the eight hour day. Um, but they also advocated for uh, issues that were specific to them, one of the main ones being fighting blue laws or um, the uh, temperance laws of the time. And according to one member of the Saloon Keepers Union who argued in 1887 that the temperance laws were basically repressive capitalism. Uh, so they were strongly German and strongly anti-capitalist. So you can see corner bars all over you know, in the built environment of Baltimore, even if they are no longer operating as corner bars. So what you can see here is uh, it's on the corner. So that's one telltale sign. And on, in this particular bar, if you go around the other side, you'll see the other door, which was known as the ladies' entrance. And that would take you directly to a back room. So when working women would partake in the free lunch, they had to go straight through that that side door grab their lunch and go into the back room because the bar proper where you would have the bar running the length of the the room um, and some stand-up space to the side of it that was a men's only space well thanks so much for for watching and please come over to the bmi to learn more um, we have our exhibit coming up um, we also have associated programs the walking tour that's going to be happening in early november um, and an author talk uh, later in October. So check out our website um, for these and other events associated with the opening.